Hi, hello. Welcome to another episode of Isaiah's Newsstand. It's your host, Isaiah Edwards. The date is January the 22nd, 2024. Hopefully this episode finds you well in good spirits and high hopes. As for me, I'm doing pretty good. Today was pretty ho-hum, back at work, you know, like we never left. Um, like I said, it went really well, or at least, you know, on the overall. Uh, we're still, you know, slow on most days, so, you know, it is what it is. Uh, hopefully, you have had a good Monday. Hopefully, you got that lasagna. Um, you know, you're feeling good, doing well. Uh, let's see here. Food corner from the other day. I had some scran, just kind of whipped up some stuff that we had. I had some fish sticks some calamari rings, and then a bowl of chili and some onion rings. Uh, and then also I had a bolillo roll and a piece of toast. So overall, just kind of came together, worked out. It was uh, pretty scrumptious. I overall enjoyed it. So yeah, there's that. Um, not really anything else to, you know, tell you about, regale you with in terms of my, my weekend, my Sunday. I didn't do too much, just kind of hung out at the house, just, you know, on some chill stuff. So, yeah, there's that. I'm going to go ahead and take my startup, get get myself right and rosy, and then we'll get into some news. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm. That is the spot. <clears> hmm. <throat> okay. From. <coughs> from. <coughs> from. <coughs> I'm going to get it out. <coughs> from the Guardian. More than. <coughs> 100,000 protests across Germany over far-right AFD's mass deportation meetings. More than 100,000 people turned out across Germany on Saturday in protest against the far-right alternative for, for Deutschland, or the AFD party, which sparked an outcry after it emerged that the party's members discussed mass deportation plans at a meeting of extremists in Frankfurt, about 35,000 people joined a call under the banner of Defend Democracy, Frankfurt against AFD, marching in the financial heart of Germany. A similar number, some carrying posters like Nazis Out, turned up in the northern city of Hanover. Protests were also held in cities including Braunschweig, Erfurt, and Castle, and many smaller towns mirroring uh, mobilization every day over the past week. And all demonstrations have been called in about 100 locations across Germany from Friday through the weekend, including in Berlin and on Sunday. Politicians, churches, and Bundesliga coaches, which are is a soccer league, if I'm not mistaken, uh, have all urge people to stand up against the AFD. Um, so this is something that I'm happy to see. It's a shame that it took something like this. Um, but um, yeah, the protest began after it emerged that AFD party members had attended meetings with neo-Nazis and other extremists to discuss the mass deportation of migrants, asylum seekers, and German citizens of foreign origins deemed to have uh, failed to integrate. So, aka, it's like this just heavily, like, nationalist idea, this, like, Germany first idea, and, like, really saying, like, oh, not just Germany first, but the OG Germans, you know, the Germans who are, like, from here, you know, actually born here, actually originate here, and, like, taking this idea and saying that if you aren't a proper German, you should just be out, and uh, among the participants at the talks, near the East German city of Potsdam, was Martin Seller, 
a leader of Australia's identitarian movement, which uh, subscribes to the Great Replacement Conspiracy Theory that claims there was a plot by non-white migrants to replace Europe's native white population. Now, the first time I think we talked about this on the pod was with, like, uh, the likes of Tucker Carlson. He was saying that shit on his fucking Fox News broadcast. Um, I mean, you see how well he's doing on Twitter. Maybe you fucking don't because... You know, he's a fucking washout has-been now. Um, But hey, uh, you know, people keep trying to plug in this idea that it's like, you know, they're just trying to get rid of us. They're trying to, like, replace us. And um, we have to do something about it right now. And, like, it just sounds so crazy on the face of it. But there are people out here who, like, they generally feel that way. Because essentially they just... It's that otherism thing. It's another thing that we've talked about in this pod of just, like, people feeling like, you know... You know what the real problem is? It's definitely not me. It's definitely not, you know, the, the system that we're all living in and you know, we're forced to just endure and, and fucking toil in. No, 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 no. The real problem is the person who doesn't look like me. The person who doesn't talk like me. That's really the issue, okay? And if we just dealt with that, I know my life, my family's life would be so much better, which it's not the case, dog. Like, that is just a, a, a form of division that people will use to get attention and power and manipulate people. And that's it. That's really all they they get something out of it but you the mob the people the little rats in the little maze you're not getting anything out of this man you're just fucking up other people other humans it's it's not good man it's a very toxic way to live and be and and to try to push this narrative around your country and your people it's it's never going to work out well it's just always going to bear bad fruit one way or another um so i'm glad though that this was something that galvanized people to come out and say yo fuck the afd because I've been seeing that over time, the AFD has kind of been like growing in support since like um, shit's kind of popped off with Ukraine. Uh, they kind of use the whole situation of like, oh, well, you see this happening. Now we have more and more people at our borders. See, we got to do something. We got to make some changes. Things got to happen. So they've been kind of like growing in the ranks, doing a little bit better. So good that something like this came to light. And people said, you know what? We need to say something. We need to stop this because clearly we're just here. We're living our lives. We're just trying to be normal and we don't want to have any of that shit. You know what I mean? We don't want to be labeled as this. We don't want to have this kind of fucking, you know, energy amongst our ranks. So good to see people step out and step up and really say, no, get the fuck out. Fuck the AFD. So, you know, I'm happy to cover this. This is, you know, some good news to cover at the top of the day. We love it. Um, Let's move on to the next beat. From the Associated Press, Modi opens Hindu temple built on ruins on raised mosque in political triumph for prime minister. Oof. So this was a doozy. Um, you know, India, definitely, they do not disappoint when it comes to the, the big news. You know, it's a big country for a lot of people and a lot going on. Um, but yes, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi on Monday opened a controversial Hindu temple built on the ruins of an historic mosque in the northern city of Ayodhya in a political triumph for the populist leader who is seeking to transform the country from a secular democracy into a Hindu state. The temple is dedicated to Hinduism's Lord Ram and fulfills a long-standing demand by millions of Hindus who worship the reverend deity and extol him for the virtues of truth sacrifice and ethical governance modi's party and other hindu national groups who seize on the demand have portrayed the temple as central to their vision of reclaiming hindu pride which they say were was suppressed by centuries of mughal rule and british colonialism i believe that they say that this is like the birthplace of lord ram and like this is why it's a sacred place and um it warranted what happened, which was a situation, I believe, in 1992. I know I have it highlighted, but it's kind of uh, along the way. But essentially, there was um, unrest. People came through and um, just raised the temple. People were killed on top of that. And um, essentially, they're like, well, what's going to happen now? And, you know, legally, they were like, oh, I think people were, like, held in prison, but then, like, released more or less as, like, heroes. So that's already very awkward. That's very unfortunate. That's very sad. But then on top of that, we're like, oh, we are going to give the, you know, the Muslim people, we're going to relocate that. We're going to get another area. 
But in this area, instead of just rebuilding the mosque that was destroyed, we are going to build this symbolic temple for Lord Ram. And um, I think this is something that was just, Modi was like, oh, this is definitely, or, you know, the people of play, I don't know if Modi was in power at this point. Probably not. I think it was 1992. But, you know, essentially, Modi was like, oh, we need to make sure this shit gets done, like, as soon as possible. Let's make this happen ASAP. And, um... Essentially, like the temple is being opened, it's been christened. He's gone in, he's done the ritual, which is like a big deal. Um, he's, he gets good, big, proudy points for that. But there are some people, you know, even who are a part of the Hindu religion, um, temple leaders or whatever, who are not going because they're like, look, this is a big faux pas. This is like spiritually incorrect to have the ceremony to do all this to open this temple, christen this temple that's not even fully ready. But at the end of the day, well, I've said this before, it's a big election year for a lot of countries, a lot of people. And Narendra Modi is one of those people who's falling under that situation. He's going for his third term. It looks like he's going to get it no matter what. I mean, he's really just pushed this narrative of like, look, we are going to become this Hindu nation. I'm going to support us. We have been suppressed for too long. We are on the rise. You know, we've talked about before in terms of um, India, you know. Just like, you know, Japan recently, they also are doing some moon shit. You know what I mean? So a lot of big strides coming out of India, a lot of, you know, advances, a lot of shit, good and bad. Um, so this is definitely something that I just saw and was like, I know that, you know, I'm kind of under the gun. I haven't really talked too much about this. I don't know too much about the history, but um, let's see if I can get to the one thing I wanted to read about. Um... Boop, boop, boop. Here we go. Um, built at an estimated cost of $217 million and spread over nearly three hectares or 7.4 acres. The temple lies atop the debris of the 16th century Babri Mosque, which was raised to the ground in 1992 by Hindu mobs who believed it was built on temple grounds marking the birthplace of Lord Ram. The site has long been a religious flashpoint for the two communities, with the demolition of the mosque triggering bloody riots across India that killed 2,000 people, mostly Muslims. The dispute ended in 2019 when a controversial decision, India's Supreme Court called the mosque's, uh, mosque's desecration a, an egregious violation of the law, but granted the site to Hindus while giving Muslims a different plot of land, which to me seems unfair. That seems very messed up. Um, and then not to mention now, you know, fast forward where we are, and it's like, okay, now this is built, and you have so many people flocking all, um, you know, throughout India to here in this area, and, you know, listening to people talk about it, like, uh, the Muslim community in this area, they're very fearful. It's like, this is bringing up old wounds for us, because it's like, now we have people, they're in a religious fervor, they're, they're saying, oh, you know, like, we should keep doing this, it's such a good thing, and... It, it just leads to this kind of fear. And then also the fact that um, other mosques are kind of fearing the same fate of like saying, oh, people in our local community, Hindus in our local community are saying, oh, maybe this mosque shouldn't be here. This is an affront. Da, 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 da. Coming up with whatever reason to maybe do the same thing again. And like if the same kind of things happen and the Hindu or the Indian government allows it to happen, that's that's fucked up. And that's something that has just been a very tumultuous, I'm sorry, back and forth that has kind of been going on, at least from what I've been kind of seeing, you know, when I look in, peep into what's the climate, what's the 411 going on in India. So, um, yeah, you know, did my best to, to talk about that. There we go. Uh, let's uh, sidle on along to the next bump, next thing. Um, from ABC News, Navy identifies two SEALs lost at sea off Yemen's off Yemen during Iranian weapon seizure. Um, obviously, SEAL being, you know, the naval thing, not actual SEALs. Orf, orf, orf. Um, the U.S. Navy has identified the two SEALs lost in the waters of the Gulf of Aden during a risky nighttime mission to board a boat carrying Iranian-made missile, uh, carrying Iranian-made missiles, missile parts, I'm sorry, to Yemen. On Sunday, U.S. Central Command announced the end of an exhaustive 10-day search and rescue operation involving multiple aircraft and surface ships to look for the two missing SEALs over a 21,000 square mile area. The military is now conducting recovery operations for the two service members 
sitcom said on Sunday night. Um, now it said that um, on the night of January 11th, one of the seals fell into the water, and then as is the protocol, um, the second seal went into the water to try to rescue them, and it looks like they are both lost at sea. Uh, let's see here. The two missing seals were identified as Navy Special Warfare Operator First Class Christopher J. Chambers and Navy Special Warfare Operator Second Class Nathan Gage Ingram, both of whom were serving with a U.S. West Coast based SEAL team. Chambers was age 37, and then Gage, uh, or Ingram, I'm sorry, was age 27. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it adds some of their accolades and, and things of that nature on the article. Obviously, my condolences to the family and, you know, all parties, people involved. It's very unfortunate. Um, but yeah, I mean, at least it shed some light onto what was going on there. It, it was definitely kind of insinuated once, you know, looking at the location. It's like, oh, this is definitely related to Red Sea shit. This is definitely like, you know, the whole Houthi Yemen stuff. So, um, you know, it, they added some light, shed some light in that. And, you know, now, you know, it's like, OK, well, we're moving on to the, the next phase of this, which is, you know, just how these things kind of go. Um, but, yeah, let's uh, let's move on. Let's uh, I got some good news. I got a treat for myself. I, I would say it's a treat for the audience, at least the general listeners. I feel like um, I mean, unless you're a conservative and you've made it this far, that's crazy. That's awesome, and I love that for both of us. <laughs> That's super fucking cool. Um, anyway, uh, let me take my break, and then um, we will we'll do a little bit of um, R.I.P. Well, not R.I.P. I mean, he's still, he's still here. He's still rocking with us. He's just not going to be a president. That's for damn sure. Anyway, yeah, let me take my break. Our last story also comes from ABC News. Ron DeSantis ends presidential campaign before New Hampshire primary. Oh, so yeah, um, I, I couldn't believe what I was hearing last night. But sure enough, Ron DeSantis is like, look, I can't I'm not even going to make it to, to New Hampshire. I think like they made it there physically, but um, he just realized that the numbers weren't with fucking with him. <coughs> I'll go ahead and read the opener here, and I'll probably riff it out from here. But um, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, who was hailed for much of last year as a rising Republican star, is ending his presidential campaign after he failed to overtake rival Donald Trump in polling or in an early vote of the 2024 race. Now, it kind of looks like what people are saying, either through interviews or talking you know, to his staff or whatever, that post the caucus, I think he kind of knew it was up. Because the way that they invested, they put so much money and time into Iowa that, like, at the very least, they weren't supposed to lose in record numbers. Like, essentially, I think they had said Trump, a, a, a Republican candidate, or maybe just even a candidate in general, has not won the Iowa caucus this way in this fashion since, like, Bob Dole or whatever. And I was like, God damn, or some shit. Or Bob Dole won a little, I don't know, whatever. But essentially, this is big numbers. Um, he's getting his own record, and and you know, DeSantis is embarrassed. Now he literally can see, like, oh man, like clearly Nikki Haley is more my competition than Donald Trump, and that's just not where you want to be. You guys are all once again dying to, or you're 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 fighting to lose, and no one wants to be in that kind of situation, especially when you have no money in your campaign, like you've blown through this shit and you're getting no results. So I think he realized like, oh, well, I kind of already know that I'm probably going to lose New Hampshire. I was going to take that L anyway. I can maybe focus on South Carolina. That's going to be the next stop. And he, and I think he just realized, everyone kind of realized that it's like, we are going to embarrass ourselves if we keep, if we keep going and we just need to stop. We need to save face. So he had his little four minute, you know, I'm out, I'm suspending my campaign speech. And um, he endorsed, Trump, which something uh, Tim Scott and a lot of people are doing, uh, I'm not really surprised by that move. I think it's one of those things where we all kind of realize that Trump is has always been king here, and like 
you've already defied him up to this point, even trying to run against him. So you might as well say, hey, let me just back a winner now. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that, I, and I, I recall even talking about this shit, how scared I was, how worried I was about DeSantis, how I didn't know how things were even going to go if his dystopian, you know, his dystopian outcome came to pass and his ass was in power. Um, so, I mean, hey, at least clap it up, because he's not. He's got to take his bullshit-ass stick to Florida and fucking rally around Ja, fucking get his shit together. Um, we'll see how that goes for him. But I think he's just, you really, the best thing about this was there is now a whole montage that you can just, just look at and see. And, you know, Andrew Make, I would love to see. Um, just from start to finish, where we are now, like, how bad he just fucking blew the shit. Like, people thought that this was literally gonna be Trump 2.0. A younger, you know, leaner version of the guy. Um, even though fucking Trump was calling him Meatball Ron and that shit was sticking like goddamn glue. I mean, at the end of the day, he just didn't have it. He didn't have the charisma. He was awkward. He was weird. He was abrasive. I think the whole idea of pushing the, like, culture war politics on people it worked in a in a state sense it worked in terms of getting you headlines and attention but when you go to actually do the shit when people see you fighting with disney like no one likes that shit dude like whether they agree with you or not they just don't want to they don't want it to get this far and um i think it's one of those things where like it's the the classic case of the the car catching the 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 dog catching the car you know and he did that shit live and people were like i don't know maybe this dude's fucking not cool (laughs) maybe he's not the the great white hope we're looking for and not to mention trump did not spontaneously combust um you know our government is still moving along at its slow ass fucking pace he's not gonna even like do any real time or any kind of real trial time so no, like he's still the guy. He's still the guy to these people, and it's still gonna be the shitty ass fucking outcome of Joe Biden versus Donald Trump, and it's just not gonna be old Ronnie. Um, that being said, Nikki's still here. She's still fighting. Um, so I mean, kudos to her. She winds up being the the guy who really, or the gal, um, who pulls the rug from DeSantis. Really, I think that was kind of the the final straw, really, and nobody knew it until we got here. Um, so yeah, there's that. We're going into New Hampshire now, and um, I think, what is that, tomorrow? Um, We'll see. Uh, I don't think she's got a shot in terms of winning, but people seem to want to talk about it like she does. But I think it's just because there's no one else to talk about now. (laughs) It's now a a uh, two-pony race now. So we'll see how that goes. I'll keep you posted on that. And, uh, yeah, Uh, I got to shill a little bit. Uh, patreon.com slash Isaiah News. If you'd like to support the effort, become a newsie today. I shout you out at the top of the month. And then let's see here. Um, three ways to, f- uh, or feedback. A uh, few ways to give feedback. <laughs> Isaiah News one at gmail.com. And then you can find me or the podcast on any of the socials you're probably on. And then hopefully you subscribe to the YouTube. Helps out a lot. Hit that like button leave a cool comment or a nice review that also helps out a ton and um also thank you to any and all new subscribers i peep that numbers are going up hey 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 we love to see you baby and um yeah thank you so much for that and uh hopefully i see you soon for some more good news i love you bye-bye